welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host of the chats, along with Mistress Joanne Gaddy, executive producer. Inside Leather History, a fireside chat, is a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. And our guest on the chats today is Fraser Lee. Fraser is the uh, president of Leatherman Scotland. Yes. All right. As we were just beginning this, you started talking a little bit about the backdrops. Would you uh, speak a little bit to that, please? <laughs> well, the flag I've got behind me, I, I thought a couple of weeks ago, I thought I need to have something more suitable as a backdrop. So I had a look online and we, we haven't done many in-person events before uh, all the lockdown happened. So we didn't have things like flags and all that at the time. So I ordered this from Canada and it arrived about three hours ago. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it is actually supposed to be, well, it is double-sided, but it's supposed to have the the other logo, the Gallic version of the logo on the other side, and it doesn't, it has the English one, but it's fine. Uh, <laughs> we will use it. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, where you're from, a little bit about your background and family. Uh, I grew up in a in the 70s, 60s, 70s housing estate on the very edge of the city, outside the city, in uh, a village which had become part of the town of Clydebank. Clydebank was, was a shipping town that was almost completely destroyed uh, during World War II. Oh. Uh, the, the Luftwaffe missed the shipyards entirely and completely destroyed the town. Oh. It was kind of town life rather than city life because we were kind of on the edge of things and, and family were, were close by. They were on the west side of the city. So it was kind of, you had the country on one side and the city on the other. My dad's family originally were from the very far north of Scotland in Caithness. Uh, I traced my male line back to 1560 where I can't go any further because there's two names the same and it, it, there's no way to tell the difference between who was who. Mm. Uh, but yeah, Caithness through and through, they, they had come to, to Glasgow and my great grandfather moved the family down because they had to work, they had to, they, they were fishing and, and farming, or well, croft, crofting communities really we would call them. Uh, but they were also carpenters, joiners, and so came to Glasgow to, to get work and have been here ever since. You, you depicted coming from a housing estate, uh, sort of on the edge of, a, of the countryside there. How? Did yeah, you... it, was, it wasn't kind of a traditional. We have, we have a, a long history in, in the UK and Scotland of council housing, hmm. where local authorities would, would own housing, and that's all changed now. It's all gone into, into housing uh, association ownership. But this was like. Uh, one of the large building companies that would have built a, a private estate, and they are they are dotted all over central Scotland. Uh, every, every every large town's got them, so it's the kind of place that uh, other places have got similar nicknames. But we used the, the nickname in Glasgow was Spam Valley, where uh, because your house was so expensive, although by standards now nothing like it now, but because because your mortgage was so expensive that you survived on spam, so it was called Spam Valley. <laughs> <laughs> I think that nickname still sticks in most areas as well, and it's certainly with other friends I knew later uh, that their estates were called the same. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Wow. How did you come to know anything about homosexuality growing up in that environment? It was very sheltered environment. It was a very, a very, very normal environment. My, my, my dad's mum and dad were very well to do and very well spoken, and and my mum's mum and dad were were more down to earth and working class. And my mum's dad had become a born again Christian at some point. Although it's something that it's something that largely passed me by because it wasn't forced onto us. It was just there in the background. And I, the, my, my memories of, of that were 
the excitement of going to uh, Candlemas at, at Christmas and New Year just because you got to light a candle and sing. <laughs> that, that was my only memories of it, really. Uh, but yeah, it was a totally normal, normal life. We, we would... Uh, we would go as a family. My dad was a joiner, and there was my mum and dad, my older brother, and myself. And we would go on a holiday every year within Scotland because we didn't we didn't have foreign holidays at those times. Uh, and my mum's mum and dad would come with us, so it would be two cars and a, and all of us and a dog going on holiday every year for two two weeks somewhere in Scotland, which was great. It was, it was a great childhood, but it was totally normal. I wasn't wasn't exposed to any of these things. I mean, I have memories of 70s television where there'd be some someone really camp and it would be it would be a figure of hilarity rather than anything else. There'd be no it would to an adult, an adult would understand some of the the jokes that children wouldn't understand. And I was probably just growing up at the time when things like children's television started, things like that. There had been television wouldn't be on during the day before that, uh, and there, there were three television channels at the time. Uh, so I remember the fourth and the fifth one starting, and we were sitting waiting on the fourth television channel to start with a countdown clock. <laughs> uh, but it was totally, totally normal. I, 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 even, I do remember. My dad had had friends who one friend was a a, a policeman, a, a beat policeman, and I I overheard a story. Uh, they probably just thought I wouldn't understand it anyway. So they were having an adult conversation, uh, and there was a story about oh, there were gay men dropping contact cards in a park, and it was oh outrageous, uh, and I barely really understood these things at that time, but. As you get a little bit older, you 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 know yourself. You start to question things in yourself before you even know what words to call them. And uh, and when I did eventually start going on the scene, I was nineteen, and and I had I was at college then, and and so I had more freedom, and, and so it was handy being close to a city. I could be in the city and about. 45 minutes by bus or so, around about that. And you could you could get the very last bus home just after 11.30. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, early, early. But later on, later on, there were night buses and uh, friends and I frequented the night buses very often indeed. <laughs> but when you, so if you went off to college and that was the first time you were really out doing anything gay, how were you even introduced to that? How did you even know about it? When I started a part-time job when I was at college, it was working for a coach company, and it was like intercity services. And so you got to meet more people, and there were gay people. There were At that time, there were drivers, conductors, or stewards who would serve tea and coffee and things on coaches. And so you were you would get to know people that you would never have known otherwise, people from all walks of life. Uh, and you got to see and hear more things. And and one day, I think one lunchtime, we, we went to the pub and it was one of the gay bars in Glasgow. And, and it was a kind of place where after that, you had to go yourself. And so it was standing at the bus stop outside, pretending you were waiting for a bus until it was all clear. And then down the stairs into the bar. But yeah, but you, you know, you, 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 you get over that fairly quickly and you don't care anymore because you realise that the fear's in your own head, really. Uh, and when other people you, are just going about their daily business and aren't even noticing. <laughs> why did you even know to go to the bar you just mentioned? Well, that was just with, with people at, at work. Uh, one, there was a couple, one, uh, they were both stewards, uh, and one of them later... Uh, took a job within the uh, office in the in the centre of Glasgow, and it was like a family. It really was like a family, and he was the first person who I was 
yeah, fairly close to that, that I had all sorts of stories from. And it was also the first person who one day came in and said that he was HIV positive. And it was really very early, as I remember. And uh, within about six months, went from telling us to being in a hospital where we couldn't visit and blind with... Uh, KS and died shortly afterwards. That's oh, no. when when I was at that age of we were that generation where we were just at that age and the government had put out this terrifying advert of like a tombstone falling over and uh, don't die of ignorance and leaflets to every house in in the country. Uh, so we were right in the the middle of of the fear of that. Mm. Uh, yeah, and when I started going out, it was it was very much the time of it, it, the the scene and whatever uh, charities and uh, volunteers had set up that they were distributing condoms to to every venue. I remember them being freely available, so it was just at that time where that started to happen. Uh, but it was a great it was a great time to come out. Uh, I I didn't come out to my parents. I was out <laughs> rather <laughs> rather awkwardly. I got home one day and and uh, my my mum had been apparently I'll I'll never know the truth because I won't ask her. But apparently she'd been looking for uh, we call it tip X white out correction. Oh. Fluid. And uh, apparently she'd been looking for that and she found like a gay newspaper. Uh, and I got all the tears and how could you let them talk you into it? Mm-hmm. I, we, I'd never really heard that said before, but it's the kind of thing I'm conscious of hearing now and still coming from America where religious communities seem to believe that you're being recruited. Yeah. So that was that was a bit of, a bit of a shock because you've got the you've got the trauma of oh my god what am I going to say to my mum along with how could you let them talk you into it and just all the misconceptions and all these things oh that was a difficult time <laughs> but you gave her a book yeah I did uh, I can't remember entirely where I got the book because it was before the internet. I mean, now it would be easy, but it was before the internet then. So I think it must have been one of the large book uh, bookstores in town. And uh, it was a book called How to Cope If Your Child is Gay. Mm-hmm. And I vaguely remember all sorts of things like religion and and. I won't be a grandparent and, you know, all these, all these subjects, sex, uh, what about HIV, all these things were all covered. Obviously, I've I've seen the book since uh, and it's been updated for more modern times, but uh, it did very much cover all the things that she really needed to have a different perspective on someone else's outside perspective on and she told me at the time I'm not reading that because it was almost it almost felt like she thought I was giving her some kind of propaganda but, mm. uh, but I did notice that there was a bookmark and it was slowly going down the pages so it was being read and it was never mentioned it was never talked about but over time there was a better understanding. There was surprised that my brother and I are so liberal. But then they brought us up to be that way. They brought us up to make our own decisions and, and make our own choices. So that's a good thing. That's mm. a good thing. Uh, I remember my, my brother was was uh, was interviewed <laughs> one evening. <laughs> interviewed. Uh, how, did you know? Why did you not say? Uh, and he says... Nothing to do with me. It's not. It's not. It's not my thing to tell you, which was quite, which was quite nice. But yeah, things things changed, uh, especially as 
when I started to see my my partner, who I'm still together with now, uh, and it turned out discovered completely accidentally that that my dad and his dad worked together for years, and so I think that really smoothed over the normality of things, and yeah, yeah, and so that there's no there's no awkwardness. But let's take a, a quick step back to the Glasgow scene that you knew when you were first coming out. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. There was an earlier period with earlier venues, which I don't, I never knew, although I'd, I'd heard names, knew where places were. Uh, this was a kind of period where there was a, an older bar called the Waterloo, uh, an older kind of, style of, of bar, more traditional. And then there were other ones that was like a long, a long thin basement bar because the the, the Glasgow's a very Victorian city. Mm-hmm. And so you tended to have offices and and, and their houses and there, there may be like basements and there may be uh, bars and things in basements underneath. Uh, all perfectly well lit, not not anything, not anything particularly secretive, but the, some most of the gay bars were concentrated in the sort of uh, southeastern quadrant of the city centre, uh, which has got the name Merchant City because that's where the city began with the merchants dealing with the West Indies and sugar and all these kind of things. Uh, but there were most of the bars were based in that area. One bar I always remember seems to be two lesbians fighting. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seemed to be perpetual. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think to stick in my head. But yeah, there, there was places frequented by younger people. Uh, the same as the same as other cities where there is a little bit of choice. People seem to move into their own little groups of it, uh, and it's good. The same's good in Glasgow. It's always been good. How did you? How did you- learn anything about the leather kink scene? Uh, I do remember, I, I must have been uh, 19, I must have been about 19, I remember the first leather man I ever saw was outside one of the nightclubs in Glasgow, outside Bennett's, it's still there but it's not called Bennett's anymore, uh, and this guy was in full leathers and I was just, <laughs> someone come up and close my mouth. <laughs> uh, that was the first time I'd ever seen anyone. And not too long after that, a friend and I, we went to one of the, the nearest big English city that had a large scene was Manchester, and it still is, because it's got its own kind of village, which is like, everything's concentrated in one area. Uh, and we we visited there, and it was the age of the clones. <laughs> uh, and so... People were very recognisable at that time. But yeah, it was something that I knew was attractive. How so? Uh, The look just really struck a chord. Uh, I always had a huge thing for guys with a moustache and a cap. (laughs) And uh, Manchester seemed to be the centre of it. When you were, you you were drawn to the image of the leather man, but how did you begin to explore the entire leather lifestyle? Very early days were certainly things like when eBay came on the scene. <laughs> eBay must be the beginning of so many people's uh, finding out what they like. And uh, I think there was like a harness or something like that for sale on eBay and, and uh, bought it. Uh, but going to places like Manchester was more eye-opening because Manchester had and still has a gay store clone zone mm. uh, selling all sorts of gear uh, and leather and postcards. So you'd see all the, the early postcards with the iconic images uh, that we used to see uh, in the early days of the internet and uh, in magazines and things like that. And so we had never really seen these things before. We'd only really seen like a kind of weekly or fortnightly newspaper style 
uh, magazine about about the scene in the UK. And so those things had listings of all the bars and clubs and uh, groups uh, throughout the UK and uh, just before the, the internet. And, and so you got to know, you would read these things cover to cover, obviously, and you would know every place and you would you would go to Edinburgh for the day and you would see what places were like. And yeah, a lot of places have changed now and a lot of places have gone. Uh, oh, the internet did change things, whether they like it or not. Sure. Some for the good, some for the bad. It's not all bad, not all good. Yeah, mixture. I remember um, Company Bar in Manchester. Yeah. I had a good time there. <laughs> The first sort of leather-ish bar I was ever in, when I was still 19, I don't know how I got away with it, but I I, I went to Amsterdam and uh, I remember going to this, it, I'm almost certain it was called Company as well, which is why I remember it then. Uh, uh, and there was... There was a dark room up the stairs, which I did venture into. Uh, I had never been, because we don't have these things here. We, they were a, a new thing entirely. Uh, so no experience of those kind of things. I did meet a lovely German gentleman. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but I, tried, I, I was all around all the places in Amsterdam and cafes and having lunch and, you know, just hanging out. On the scene because you could, yeah, it was it was a good time. Yeah. So that was probably the first kind of slightly more leathery place I've been. Although after that, there was a, an American guy. He was from Minnesota or something, I think, uh, staying at the same hotel that I was at, and and so we were just talking. And I think we went to the web one early evening, and to my absolute horror, I. I, I had to be taken outside by him because the wall of poppers that hit me was just like, <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, I got an eye full of the surroundings and then whew, I had to go <laughs> take too much. <laughs> so that, that was my real first look at these things. But uh, yeah, it was, it was a while before I got to, to go back to anything like that really. <laughs> Now, how did your interests evolve, such as uh, how did you learn your sort of protocols in the community? After I started to see my partner, a couple of years after that, I really stopped frequenting the scene so much. I did go through a patch where, with the clear benefit of hindsight, I was very depressed. The overthinking, the worry... Uh, and I phoned the doctors, went to the doctors, and I was introduced to the marvel of Prozac. <laughs> and I went from having a negative attitude, which was just my whole outlook was negative. Uh, whereas now I would be planning something, so I had things to go to rather than to get out of. And it totally changed my outlook. Uh, I wanted to do things again. And that was really what kick-started that I knew I loved gear. Oh. The few years before that, there was a website called Gear Fetish. There is a modern version of it, but it isn't the same one. But that was a time when there was everything on there. Leather, rubber, uniform, everything. So I was exposed, if you like, to all these things and started seeing things that I liked at that time, but so it didn't really have uh, Well, loads of fetishy stuff. <laughs> leather, I've always liked leather. Uh, also like sports gear, I like shiny gear. So shiny black, yeah, that, it, wasn't, it wasn't such a huge jump to leather. But these things just kind of gradually introduced you. Uh, and so you you saw more things. I wasn't really aware. I, I knew, even going to Manchester, I knew there were like guys in leather. Uh, but I wasn't really aware of any 
it's a deeper level of seeing beyond that. What fetishes do you enjoy? What activities? I would say I am mostly sub. Uh, not entirely. I still have possibilities, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it, emotionally it, it's more satisfying. My partner and I went to Berlin probably about 2015, I think. But just before we went, I had been talking to someone online and I asked if I could meet this guy mm -hmm. in Berlin. And my partner said he didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. So we had a rough few days trying to talk. And then by like the night before it was clear we were we were going. Uh, and we went to Berlin and had a lovely time and visited all the tourist places and you know, then we, we didn't do the gay places really. Uh, we did uh, all the touristy places. And one night we finished dinner and he went to the hotel and I went to meet uh, this lovely German gentleman with full leathers in his own playroom uh, who absolutely blew my mind. And that was the first time I'd ever met anyone quite like that. And then when I came back from that, uh, I, within a, within a very short period, uh, uh, talking to someone purely by chance online uh, and he was a dome in the Midlands of England and I went down to see him and I was visiting him basically every month for two years <laughs> from then. Uh, I actually wore his collar for a year as well uh, and it was an amicable end I think because him and his partner were kind of moving away from the scene that was when I needed to be in the scene. I needed the friendship. I needed the uh, the, the people around me. Uh, but he actually took me to my first leather social and took oh. me to get measured for uh, leather jeans and a waistcoat was the first that I got. And then after that, I went myself quite fine. Let's explore uh, Leatherman Scotland. Tell us, how yeah. did that begin? I knew I would never have got onto the scene without someone taking my hand and taking me. I can remember at the hotel we were in in Manchester, getting ready. I mean, he was in full leathers, cap, the works, looked awesome. <laughs> but I remember... I needed someone to take me and show me it's okay and meet some people. And actually, before we went, uh, in Manchester, they do normally, in October, they do the Manchester Leather Weekend. Yes. And I had actually booked for that and paid for it and booked my hotel and my transport in order to force myself that this is done, you are going. And then I had a thought, I thought, I'm going to need to know a couple of people really realistically before I go. So he took me and we met some of the regulars at the, the social. And people come and go. Mm. Uh, but there's still a lot of the people who were there at that time still about. And so at the time, I was looking for some kind of community here. A couple of the guys at Manchester Leathermen suggested, why don't you try a social in Glasgow. Uh, and so I did. And so April 2019, yeah, April 2019, uh, I started the social. I uh, advertised it as much as I could online, Twitter, you know, everywhere, word of mouth, etc. Uh, and my partner came with me. I'm thinking, oh my God, no one's going to turn up. But people did. There were about 15 people or something. Oh, great. And, uh, and that was even with, it was Easter, and the big event in Europe then is Folsom 
Uh, no, not Fulton, uh, Eastern, Eastern Berlin. Yes, yes. Uh, and so some mm. of the guys mm. now who are regulars were away. So the whole ethos that I wanted it to be was to encourage people to come out and to give them the help to come out. And that was even down to no dress code and a venue which was bright and open and accessible. Uh, instead of the, the more natural venue now which is a place which is down a dark staircase and round the corner and round another corner into the darkness. Uh, and new people, young guys, a little bit frightened of that. Uh, so chose one venue, which is complete glass front, lovely and open, bright, an outside smoking area, an outside front seating area for nice weather. Uh, and we actually went to Pride that year. Uh, a group of about 20 of us were right at the, almost at the front of the Pride March. I was second in the, in the march. Uh, and it just gradually grew and grew little little by little. And at the at the year, our last in-person social was March 2020. And at that point we knew we are going into lockdown yeah. very soon. Yeah. Uh, and we had planned we were going to have a an in-person meeting uh, in the April because uh, that was a year and we were going to decide what what do we want to do. At that time, we were actually, it was actually just calling it Glasgow Leather Men and the, or, or Glasgow Leather Social, really, we were just calling it. Uh, but what we did was we uh, we had a, an online meeting. Uh, quite a lot of people came, quite a lot of the, the regular people came along. Uh, because we had uh, a group on Facebook that we've really kind of held everything together on. Uh, and we decided in the April uh, that we wanted to become a club, uh, still with the full intention that socials will be open to all. Yeah. And at the time, uh, when lockdown did come, we just by chance on social media saw information that uh, the Scottish Government had a fund which they were distributing through a charity, uh, the Equality Network. And their intention was to try and uh, to try and help with social isolation during uh, lockdown in particular. And at that time, applied for that and, and got uh, funding for, for a Zoom licence every month. So every month they paid for that. So uh, the it was supposed to be two or three months and... Here we are. Uh, the funding ends on the 31st of this month. And they emailed me last week to say, if you apply for a one-year license now, we will pay for it. So they've actually, they've actually overall paid for 12 individual months and a year on top of that. We've done all sorts of things. We've done uh, a cocktail class. We've had uh, game shows, uh, rip-offs of 70s and 80s game shows. Yeah. Uh, we've had quizzes, uh, bingo, all sorts of things. Cards Against Humanity is a favourite. Uh, and as well as being helpful for various people, it's been helpful for me. I, I would previously have said suffering from depression. I would have said I was uh, introverted. But there are things that I just, you do because you have to, because you're in that position. Yeah. And with the social, I, I, I made a point that no one would be left standing on their own. Everyone would be welcomed and brought into the group. And just where, just where the in-person socials ended and we moved online, there were some people who were just about to come to the socials and started coming online, and now they know everyone. Oh, yeah, yeah. And now they feel part of it. In fact, one of them is now membership secretary uh, because he's so invested in it. Great. Uh, and, Great. and it's allowed people to, to get to know each other. And uh, we are actually now at the stage where we are about to tentatively try to take a step back out into face-to-face -face social world. 
uh, we, we are planning to have an in-person social with allocated seating and table service uh, in late June. Great, uh, great. So fingers crossed on that. And to show the demand for it and the friendships that have built up, that within 24 hours, 34 people had applied to attend. Oh, wonderful. Uh, we, we extended people's memberships by three months if they joined before Christmas. Uh, so the first memberships, because we started in April, the first memberships finish in July. Uh, but currently we have 91 members. A couple of those are people who we have subsidised. Uh, because we, we, we very much wanted at the beginning that uh, cost shouldn't be a factor. Yeah. The, the same as... The same as everyone worries at the beginning that their gear isn't good enough, that they are not good enough. Uh, people worry about, oh, I can't afford that £15,000 jacket. Well, neither can I. So, so we don't want that. When people were joining, ordinary members were joining, we had an option where they could join at £12, a pound a month, or they could pay 15 and that extra would go towards... Oh, subsidising someone else yeah. and the vast majority paid extra, in fact some people uh, paid quite a lot extra uh, and we've had various donations and things like that uh, and we have struck up a very close friendship with Leathermen of Ireland uh, mm -hmm. that, that we, we essentially joined together because we've, we go to each other's events and we make sure that, that we don't clash uh, they held their first birthday party and we all attended. Uh, one of their members, uh, John O'Brien, who's quite well known. I know John. Uh, I know. <laughs> he uh, regularly held fundraising events for the Gay Switchboard in Ireland. Yeah. And can't, can't do that just now because of COVID. I mean, they, they would do things like secondhand gear events and things like that. Uh, and so... There was an online event, and there were a hundred of us there. Two teams from our group, uh, other groups from across Ireland, and 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 people from all over the UK. So there were a hundred of us there all together. And one of our teams that I was in came second, and we won a hundred a hundred euros. And they wouldn't let us donate it because we had raised so much money already. Uh, so they gave us a hundred pounds, and we donated that to two. Uh, two gay charities, uh, one uh, Waverly Care, which is hospices, and the other one was the Equality Network, the, the group who had uh, overseen the, the funding for Zoom from the Scottish Government, so we wanted to try and give a little bit back to them. So, Are you looking to join the ECMC, the overall consortium? Uh, we initially, initial thoughts were... My last time at Folsom was in 2019, Folsom Europe, sorry, was in 2019. And I had met various people from ECMC, including Daniel Dumont. He's yes. very, very nice and very, That's very encouraging. Me. Huge loss. Yes. Uh, and, and others from Belgium. Uh, Mr. Leather Belgium was there and from Amsterdam. And, and they were very encouraging. And uh, we learnt at that stage that MSC Scotland were closing they were winding up and we had thought in order to retain the history perhaps we can merge and move forward but it became impossible and dialogue just wasn't there uh, and so it was hoped at that stage that we could retain the ECMC membership because they were going to give it up otherwise. But in order to shed what was obviously baggage in the background that we didn't particularly know about, uh, we let it go. And so at our, our first AGM back in April this year, one of the propositions at the AGM was that we would like to join ECMC, and that was unanimous, uh, and a unanimous decision. And uh, various other members were, were there uh, who who come from uh, Master Leatherman, Leatherman Cymru in Ireland, uh, in Wales, sorry, Leatherman Cymru in Wales, 
uh, and someone from London Leatherman said uh, out loud, there and then, we will support you. You need you need the support of two full member clubs. So that's we have the support of three full member clubs. Right. Uh, right. So is our intention uh, to apply to join at the next AGM or BCMC, and then that will make us, if accepted, that would make us a probationary member for a year, and then we would apply to become a full member. So yes, that is what we would like to do. At the last AGM, which was online, Leatherman Cumbria allowed me to join as an observer so I could see the process. And I have seen many of these people at places like Folsom Europe sure. and sure. Manchester Leather Weekend. It really brings everyone together even more than a single club does. Uh, ECMC in particular, did a lot of work uh, on raising funds to yeah. get people out of Chechnya. Yeah. Uh, the Rainbow Railroad, they raised, raised a lot of money for that. So there's, there, there are things to be done and joining together to do more is, is a good thing. And that is, if I have my acronym correct, it's the European Consortium, Consortium of Motorcycle Clubs, correct? Yeah, okay, I wanted to be... I did have a motorcycle in my 30s. <laughs> <laughs> I missed out that, I missed out that. That, that, was, that, was, that was one of my earlier attempts to try and find some kind of scene, but it was unsuccessful. But I did have a motorcycle for about mm, six or seven years or so. <laughs> and the leathers. <laughs> but tell me, what is unique about the Scottish leather kink scene? It is a far smaller scene. We do have quite a lot of members from Goodwill from outside of Scotland. Great, fine. Uh, we have quite a number of very invested members from the north of England, uh, north east of England mm -hmm. and uh, around Manchester in particular. And some of that's through my involvement with Manchester Leathermen. Uh, I do have a lot, a lot of friends there, a lot of friendships. Uh, but other people... Uh, have been drawn in and I know of several people who we were just there at the right time for them and they needed something people to grab hold of them and say come in, it's yeah. fine uh, and we did that a little in person, I, I talked about how we don't have a dress code at the events uh, it is difficult to walk through a city in full gear. Yeah. The one difference I, I, I've done it a number of times, places like Berlin, no one bats an eyelid. Right? Places like Manchester, people will, will go, why am I here? Etc. Yeah. But, but in, in Glasgow, you get a bit of what we would call banter. But I have walked through a few times with other people. And if you don't have your cap on, people don't notice. Mm. The cap freaks them out. <laughs> uh, and so I remember one person who, who, who is unfortunately no longer involved. They didn't come the first month because they were too nervous. Second month they came in jeans and t-shirt. The third month they came in leather jeans and jacket. And the fourth month they came in, and marched in pride in full, oh. in full gear. So I kind wondering. of showed you the the steps of confidence of being able to, to do that and knowing it's okay, it's fine. And we, we have we have trans members and non-binary members, uh, mostly men. It's a couple of women, including a woman, woman I used to work with years ago who's, who's a biker. Uh, but we, we, we have, we have a, a good split of people in the west of Scotland and the east of Scotland. But we've done all sorts of things like we had we had gone into uh, in order to not make it all based around a bar and alcohol. Scotland has a long problem with alcohol. Uh, we started doing lunch or brunch before mm -hmm. before our meet, and it was a chance to to meet and have a, a coffee or or food. And we want to start that again when we can. Uh, we did. Uh, 
at Christmas, just before Christmas in 2019, we had Christmas dinner, and there were 30 of us along a huge table in this lovely Italian restaurant. Uh, but we wanted to do more things like that. We had plans to do whiskey tasting events and all go for afternoon tea in a posh hotel and you know, all these things, open top bus tour, uh, and they're all on the plan that we still want to do. When we were preparing for this, uh, I was a bit naive when you told me that you conduct your meetings bilingually. Tell us about that. The plan from day one was to try and do certainly online things bilingually. Uh, Scottish Gaelic is an old language and is now spoken by about 2% of the population. Uh, and there's a fear it could die out. Related historically to Irish, but uh, quite different now. Yes. Uh, but we do have a Welshman who lives in central Scotland, who uh, learned Gaelic and now teaches uh, at school, uh, a class at school through the medium of Scottish Gaelic. So it's like teaching physics yes. but through Gaelic. Uh, and we also have another gentleman and his partner who have just joined, and he is another who is fluent in Gaelic. Uh, I'm not fluent, but I love it. <laughs> uh. Uh, so we, we made a big effort to have a couple of the the, inform the main information pages on our website, the one, the the Hello About Us page, and the one I looked at for that. Yeah. yeah, as being being bilingually and and on a proper on a desktop machine they're side by side yes, on a mobile they are one above the other but yeah that's their intention and i've got i've got badges and stickers uh, ready for events in both languages because people will want both because it's it's a unique thing <laughs> where do you see the group in five to ten years it's difficult to know i think we we have a significant number of people just now who are invested in things and their investment is what makes it happen. We've, we've got, we know there are other people here who are into gear who, are, who, who, who don't come, who don't get involved. And that's fine. That's fine. You can't make people get involved. And things like uh, Zoom, some people just don't like that. It has held us together very, very successfully. Yes, and uh, it enables this interview. <laughs> exactly. But we've also tried things like uh, quiet sessions because we've, we've had some where uh, we always try and make sure everyone gets a chance to talk uh, because there are people who are naturally more outgoing than others. And so at the moment we're having a fortnightly Wednesday evening quiet chat. Uh, and that's with one of our Gaelic speakers who, who hosts that in English. And we do intend when we're able to go back fully to in-person things, oh, okay. that there will still be some online because it's clear that there are good, strong friendships mm, mm. and people want more time together. It's easier for them than having to travel 60 miles to meet in a bar on a Sunday afternoon. Wow. And they want a bit more than that. Init initially, the reason it was the third Sunday of the month, the Manchester Leather Social was the first Saturday of the month, <laughs> and I would go to that, so it would make it kind of uh, halfway between each other. Uh, and we were going to try initially, well, we'd do a Saturday, but then these bars are full on a Saturday. Yeah. A Sunday afternoon, you can take over the place, you can take over the venue, you can talk. Yes. Uh, we have some people who really, really got into karaoke. <laughs> and so we had a bit of that as well. Uh, we've got some of us, myself included, who like a cigar, and we've got the opportunity to do that. Uh, we were just getting to the point where the venue was really wanting to support us. And so they were going to give us sandwiches and things like that. And then... Oh then COVID and we couldn't do that anyway, even if we could go to the venue, we couldn't. Uh, but we're hoping things like that will start up again. And the, it was actually the venue owner 
uh, because it's obviously been difficult for all of these venues and, and it's he's yeah. it's worked very hard uh, and he actually got in contact and says I want you back and great. how can we make that happen yeah great so yeah we haven't seen each other in person for oh, God, be 15 months or something it could be a little rowdy and we'll have to control people and make sure they stay sitting down. Because <laughs> it has to be seated and it has to be table <laughs> service and yeah. But but we're, we're gonna try it and see and see how it goes because people are desperate to see each other again. They really are. What's the biggest misconception about you? I I have had, and as as part of this group, I have had to force myself to do things, force myself to be more outgoing. If something goes wrong, I'm the one ultimately in charge and I have to deal with it. Mm. And I have to take the flag as well as the praise, but the praise gets shared amongst the group. If generally we make it, if it's something good, publicise it as the group, not an individual. Right. Uh, it is the work of the group. But yeah, the biggest misconception about me is is that I'm extremely outgoing. Uh, there is a lot of fake it until you make it. Well, Fraser Light, correct? I'm not sure I'm getting that right. Lee. 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 Fraser Lee. I promise I'll practice. <laughs> I thank you very, very much for being part of Inside Leather History of Fireside. Thank you, man. Yeah.